In today's global economy, quality matters. Benjamin Franklin once quipped, the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. Quality Matters is here to talk about all things quality. So whether you're looking to improve your business, getting ready for an audit, or dealing with failed inspections, tune in, check us out, then get back to doing work that matters. Well, hello and welcome back to the Quality Matters podcast, where quality management gets simplified, brought to you by Texas Quality Assurance. So today we've got another guest on here. We actually met through a, another guest on the uh, podcast, through uh, Chris Paris. Today we have uh, Michael Mills on with us, and he has a ton of real-world experience, has a fantastic blog on quality, tons of useful real-world information if you're actually looking to make real improvement in your business. So really excited. To uh, to bring Michael on to the podcast, so here we go. Say hello to the world. Hello, world. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, tell me a little bit about kind of. I'm always curious how everyone got into quality. I have yet to find anyone that said they were going to be in quality. We all managed to wind up here some weird way, and I've not asked you that question yet, but I'm going to bet it's probably the the truth. So, uh, how'd you get yeah. here? <clears throat> um. So years and years ago, I was I was working in telecom. Uh, it was a, at the time it was a um, small small internet startup. Uh, we had the idea that we were going to be head to head competitors with Ascend, which didn't work out so well for us at the time. <laughs> but you know, it was a nice it was a nice idea. Yep. Um, and <clears throat> um, we started getting demands that we needed to certify to ISO 9001. Well, yep. at the time I was I was in the uh, in general engineering department, I was handling a lot of the documentation activities. Makes sense. And so our our VP of engineering said, Michael, go take a class. Find out what this is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very sure. familiar. You know, yeah, kind of in your free time when you're not yes. doing anything yes. else. Yes. So this is so non-time consuming at all. Sure. So, you know, I <laughs> went and uh, took a lead auditor class from, from, gosh, I think it was Perry Johnson, actually. Yep, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> and um, it went from there. You mm -hmm. know, I just started getting more and more into doing this and realized there's actually a lot to do here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, time went on, we were bought out by one of our customers. And then after a while, um, you may remember in the early 2000s, telecom kind of yep. popped. And um, <clears throat> so I ended up uh, working for Bosch. Uh, it was sort of a similar situation, a small local company that had been acquired mm -hmm. by Bosch Worldwide. Um, and worked for them for 17 years, and now I'm currently doing stuff, uh, locally here and there yeah. for, um, as needed. And meanwhile, putting my opinions out on the internet, as you say, <laughs> writing a blog and trying to tell funny stories of which yep. I've got, you know, a, well, a fair you, share. You mentioned something here earlier. Oh, I thought this is the perfect intro. So this, this was this was this was a yeah, this was an interesting <laughs> experience. We had um so I was supporting an external audit. Uh mm -hmm. a large part of my role was managing the audit program, which mm -hmm. meant that I plan and conduct many of uh the our internal audits across a number of different locations. We had mm -hmm. like uh, seven or eight different offices That's across fun. the U.S. Yep. Um, but then when the external auditors would come, I mean, I'd schedule them and then I would also um, go You'd out. You'd be the one and representing, yeah. I'd be, I'd be the host. I'd be, you know, which, which That's a good way I to tried put it, to the host. I, I, I tried to pitch this to the or, to our organization as you know, think of me as counsel for the defense in this case. <laughs> uh, you know, because yes. usually I'd show up and people would say, "Oh, hi, Mike. I'm not. You're not auditing me today, are you?" <laughs> <laughs> I have had that but, before too. <laughs> but you know, no, I'd, I'd show up and I'd be, um, you know, 
explaining what the auditor really meant when he asked for this. And yes. it was, you know, but he was speaking in auditorese, which yes. was like a foreign language. Anyway, it this really, the, uh, it really, I, really can be. And it, it drives folks up the wall, especially if you're talking someone that's working in like a machine shop or something of that nature. And they're oh, yeah. like, I huh? really have what? no idea what he just said. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and, you know, since I had been through two months earlier doing the internal, I knew what they were doing. I knew how yeah. all this stuff worked. And I could just say, yeah, what he means is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm, I'm supporting this uh, this external audit. And um, <clears throat> the uh, the guy is... You know, we, we go through the morning and the opening meeting and the first few interviews, and he seems a little intense, but otherwise nothing terribly strange. Sure. And then we sit down for lunch. We have lunch brought in, you know, we're yep. sitting there just chatting. And he starts explaining to me in detail um, how the world is actually being run by intergalactic <laughs> space lizards. <laughs> this is awesome. And I make was like, Wait, what? <laughs> um, and you know, I—I I mean, he's the auditor. I don't want to insult him, but right. uh, so I—I I, I just play along like I'm an idiot. And I say, "Oh, I had no idea," because <laughs> gosh, you know, I never read about that in the newspapers. Oh, well, you know, they don't put that in the newspapers because, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, and, and, yeah, intergalactic space lizards. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> that was. Um, and you know, um, he he also explained. He had explained earlier that he had been involved in um, early committee activities to prepare ISO nine thousand one back from the beginning, and I started well, reevaluating. Now we know that where story. all went wrong. The yeah, space right. lizards got involved. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I I started thinking. Okay, yeah, I'm going to put all these stories in the same bucket here. Um <laughs> because that was just that was just different. But oh, you know, man. it was it it kept it lively. Yeah. Yeah. That that is probably the uh the most uh extreme version of an auditor story <laughs> I I think I've heard. Um but it, it happens so. You just I hate to say this, but you have to pacify the auditor, let them feel good, let them feel smart. And yep. Yep. not all now, of them are that way, but there's a handful that, man, that, that ego, it, it's got to stay inflated. Yeah. They, I mean, the, the thing is, there's sort of a fine line there because on the one hand, you don't want to tick them off because, you know, that can have bad consequences. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you don't want to build your organization around no. making the auditor happy yes. because then you end up doing double work. You do mm -hmm. real work mm -hmm. and then you have to build this whole cardboard mm -hmm. uh, construction to, to satisfy the auditor. And you know, nobody has time for that. No. And we, if you're busy doing real work, you're going to, the cardboard one is going to fall apart anyway. Yeah. And he's going to write you up for something meaningless because it shouldn't yep. have been there in the first place. We and, spent a lot of time this week. We've got a client that's going through just a stage one audit this week. Yeah, so the auditor, you know, and this happens and I get it. So this is human nature, but the auditor really wants certain things documented in a certain way. And probably at least five times this week, I, I'm, I said, look, we're going to document this the way it needs to be done. We're not going to document the same thing in four places to make it easier for the auditor. We're going to run our business. Right. And yes, exactly. It, it's real easy to, oh, well, he wants it there. Well, sure, 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 sure. We'll do that. But then you're documenting the same thing in three places and you're going to forget oh. one of them. You're oh, going to yeah. forget. As soon as you document the same thing in more than one place, they will drift apart. Yep. This is a, this is a law of nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I can understand trying to make things not baffling for the auditor. But what I mean by that is, you know, if you design your system the way it needs to be for you. And then maybe the week before the audit, you write up a, a, a small little matrix yep. that says, for this, go see here. Correct. For this, go see here. And so it's got you know, a record. That's not a document. That's a record for this audit. Right. Exactly. And you know, you could even you could even to make it really easy, just put the clauses of the standard down one column and a whole slew of links mm -hmm. down the other one. And, uh -huh. you know, then you can just say, all right, Mr. Auditor, 
here's what we've got. We prepared this for this audit, um, but it's not, yeah, as you say, it's not a document that is maintaining in the long term. It's yeah. just a, a help. Yep. And you can sit here and just start clicking links. And when you click on that link and you want more information besides the, uh, the material that it leads you to, we'll call Fred. And yeah. for this one, we're going to call Max. Yep. And this one we'll call Kyle or, you yep. know, whoever yep. it is. Yep. <clears throat> Well, there, folks, that, that's at least a full day of consultation, advice, and support. Y'all can go ahead and send this <laughs> check. You know, we'll be glad to take it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, what we wanted to talk about today is, you know, in our conversation we had earlier this week, you know, you're really bringing to light something that, in my opinion, the most boring, oftentimes m most confusing, why the heck is this here clause in the standard? Well, you found a lot of value to it. So we're talking about yeah. the context of the context organization. Of the organization, yeah. So when I first, I remember when 2015 first came out and I'm looking at it, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I kind of like this interested parties thing here because it gives me a way to document requirements I have that affect right. quality. Because right. I'd had an auditor previously um, try to write a finding on the 2008 edition where uh, I hadn't documented my legal requirements. And he's like, well, you have to document legal requirements. And I said, why? And he pointed to clause one. And I'm like, well, clause one's That's not, not auditable. auditable. <laughs> and so we got in this weird little conundrum um, here. Yeah, and so right. when I first read, I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you know, I get this. I, you know, I kind of like that. Um, but beyond that, I'll be honest with you, it took a while for me to find much extra value <clears> in it. So I'll just kind of open up the door door to you here to, to talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So the the thing about context of the organization i mean there's there's sort of there's sort of two sides to it there's the side of knowing what it is and then there's the side of what what part do you want to document okay now now the first part you more or less at some level you know what the context of your organization is or you can't keep your doors open right right you basically i mean you have to know more or less who your customers are. You have to know what your legal requirements are, because if you're not following them, someone's going to come after you. You know, <laughs> you have to know other things that are going on. What are the issues that are happening in the world that might affect you? Maybe mm -hmm. not every last one of them, but you know, if if someone is if there's a there's a bill in the legislature that's going to make your business illegal, you know, you might want to know about it. True. Things like this. Yeah. So by virtue of the fact that your doors are open mm -hmm. um, and, and you're making money, you mm -hmm. somehow know the basics of the context of your organization. And I've but, run into some weird situations with some of the oil and gas companies we work with, because yeah. there's some weird relationships between these companies. Sometimes Oh yeah, you can have, two organizations that are both partially owned by the same company uh -huh. and they are both customers and competition to each other. And so context okay. can create some very weird webs sometimes. It can, it can. <laughs> and, you know, as an aside, but, but as an aside, let me also add that uh, when you talk about bringing in interested parties, um, I think that that's valuable uh, as because it's more general than customers. Correct. Because sometimes you've got people that aren't exactly customers, mm -hmm. but they have an effect somehow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I use this I, I use this as an example once when I was uh, arguing with somebody over whether you could apply uh, the ISO standards to something like a university. I said, you know, mm -hmm. and this was this was back in the 1994 edition. Oh. I said, I said, you know, who's the customer? And the person said, well, that's obvious, the students. I said, the students aren't the customer; they're the product. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so are the parents the customer? Well, they're the right. ones paying the bills, but are they getting any benefit out of it? No, you know, the students' employers are getting benefit out of it, but they're not paying for it. Well, right. you know, so it gets very confusing. But if you say interested parties, fine, they're all interested parties. Yep. They yep. want different things and Correct. their engagement is different, but they're all interested parties. Yep. Now, but so the thing is what you 
what you want to document about your context is really going to depend on what you need it for. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> you know, when we... Well, um, all I want is to put my shirt up on the wall. That's all I need it for. Bingo. Well, if you need, okay, fine. If that's what you, if that's what you needed for, if you're looking to get certification, then you know you can do it. You can do the analysis in an, in an afternoon mm -hmm. if that's all you need. If it, and you're just the going value through it, but you're not gonna no no. Um, but if you start going through it, then <clears throat> and you pay a little more attention. What we found um, was that you can, a lot of other things just fall out of that very naturally. So, mm -hmm. for example, uh, you start identifying business risks. Now, mm -hmm. your large-scale business risks, you more or less probably know anyway, but, but as you're working your way through it, you begin to see things, oh, yeah. I always knew in the back of my head this was a problem, but we never really did anything about it. Okay, why don't you make a list? Yeah. Put it on the list, and, you know, you'll come back and revisit that list once a year. But exactly. Now you don't forget it. You know, so so we had we had um, a situation where we said, <clears throat> uh, you know, we've got certain kinds of products that we're designing and selling, and today life is good there's a demand for the products our customers are happy mm -hmm. but we're able to foresee how 10 years down the road the advance of technology might render these products obsolete very good point now you know it might not on the other hand if we can figure that out there are other smart people out there in the world who aren't us they right. could probably figure it out too. Yep. And so we want to start thinking about that. We don't need to solve the problem next week. No, but it's but, a good way to just have something there. It's input for the management review and bingo. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> and so you, so you, you, you create a list of some of these kinds of risks and um, <clears throat> then decide you know do i need to work on this now or can mm -hmm. i wait till the next review i don't yeah. need to work on it now but the next review maybe you say you know what next year we're going to start an exploratory project and mm -hmm. you know frank and gary you guys spend you know a couple hours a week or whatever it is just looking into this and see mm -hmm. what if we need to do something and then come report back and then we'll make another decision next time yep um and so you can go on. What also happens um, is that now usually this kind of thing is is sort of you're reconstructing it after after the fact, but the entire scope of your quality system sifts out of the context of your organization mm -hmm. because okay, you're in business manufacturing widgets yep. or designing and manufacturing widgets, and so okay. So the context of your organization tells you you've got customers, they want widgets, the widgets have to do this, uh, and so forth. By the time you've finished listing that, mm -hmm. there's your scope. Yeah. That's your scope. And in effect, it's also giving you all the parameters around what your quality management system needs to be. Now, nobody starts a business where they haven't even incorporated yet, and they start by doing this. Right. Obviously, you start. You start. However, you start, mm -hmm. and you get your feet under you, and you get moving. Yep. But when it comes time that you start thinking about, gee, I want a cert to hang on the wall. Then, if you if you begin at the top, you begin with mm -hmm. the context of your organization. You will be able to derive from that uh, your major business risks, the scope the parameters that you have to impose upon your processes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rather than just saying, well, I'm going to, you know, download somebody else's process and I was off the internet because it'll save me time. Yeah. Good luck I thought with that, that was a proper way to do it. Well, you know, it, 
<laughs> it it saves you time for the first five minutes, and then you try right. to apply it and go, "What the heck am I doing here?" <laughs> but you know, if you if you then get the parameters there, and it, it helps you also decide, or or to identify clearly what kind of a business you're trying to be. Um, so what I mean by that, uh, you know, I spent a lot of years in tech and mm -hmm. um, the word quality in tech means two different things because things change so fast. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to be the best, of course, right. everyone wants to be the best. What does best mean? Does the best mean you want to be first <laughs> to market with the new technology? Yep. Or does best mean you want to sell flawless technology? Well, you're going to have to design your entire QMS differently, depending on the answer to that question. Amen. Um, because everybody knows that the first person to market with the new technology gets the fame, they get the headlines, and it's going to be full of bugs. Yep. I mean, th that's just the nature of the beast. Yep. That, And the person who, co the company that comes along that, build something that's flawless is going to be significantly later and mm -hmm. it will cost more. Yep. But when you install it, it works. Okay. No, look at uh, Blackberry and uh, Apple iPhone. Boom. Yeah, exactly. We Done. were talking about that on a call this morning. Like I miss, I know I sound old, but I miss the little buttons. I, I can tell you <laughs> not look at my phone. Yeah. Well, and you know, and, and, there's a place for each of those. Mm -hmm. And so somebody has to be first and somebody has to be mm -hmm. you know, bringing up the rear, but producing something that is very stable. Well, we you know, had a similar issue in, in uh, Texas Quality Assurance. Uh -huh. So when we first started in the company, um, we knew we wanted to work with small and mid-sized businesses, but we hadn't defined it real well. And so, as I think a lot of folks, when they start a business, you're just happy to get revenue wherever they can get it from, and we'll kind of figure it out as we go. Turns right. out that's a bad way to do things, but it is what <laughs> I did for the first few years, right? And so that worked well enough until COVID hit, and you really had to narrow down what you do and don't do. Okay. And so for the first few years, what we did is we developed, you know, it was rather pricey, but very highly customized, very detailed, very, very, very unique to every customer uh, software solutions. And right. it worked well, you know, it worked well. It definitely it paid the bills. Life was good. I had much fewer projects. They lasted longer, but, you know, it worked. The customers were happy and my family was happy. Life's good. Well, COVID hits. No one wants that anymore. You know, they want a um, low risk, high functionality, you know, very quick, you know, type job. And it's like, well, I'm now making about a 20th off of each project that I used to make before. How am I going to do this? Um, and so it did. It forced us to reevaluate it. And, and I went back to the, the context clause. And I was like, OK, well, what what type of company am I? Like, really, what what type of company am I? Because I keep doing what I'm doing. I'm a I'm a bankrupt company. And that's that's not a that, I don't that's think not, that fits that's, well. That, that's not who you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. No. So we had to really, um, you know, kind of put on our big boy shoes and say, who do we want to be when we grow up? And, you know, it, it's, like, you know, different example, but it's the same type thing. It's like oh, exactly. you, you, you define either who you are or who you're going to be. And let's work towards that. And this is, you know, ultimately, I mean. You you read anything written by Peter Drucker, and the thing that he's always complaining about is he says business management always tries to avoid this question because they always go after the questions that are easy to answer, mm -hmm. which, okay, great, but and it's nice to have answers to those. But the question, who are we? Who's our mm -hmm. customer? What are we in business for? Yep. So if you can't answer that or you don't answer that, it's only a matter of time before you fail. Yeah. You have to be able to do that. And when things change, this is the other thing about context of the organization is it changes. Yes. Because the world is not static. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone Spoiler that doesn't realize alert. that now is blind. <laughs> yeah, right. And so 
you have to be able to reevaluate that. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you know, seriously pivot. This is exactly what you were talking about. Um, That you say, okay, we had this and this was our context. And because of that, we were doing A. Mm -hmm. The context has changed. The world has changed. Now we need to do B. All of that is wrapped up in 4.1 and 4.2. Mm-hmm. That's what it's about. And yeah, if you use your management review or whatever tool you use to reevaluate that from time to time, then you're able to pivot when you have to do it. Um, <clears throat> which, you know, ultimately any company does to to stay alive. You know, but they don't often document when that change occurs. It's just no. kind of, well, this is what we're doing. And it's like, mm, is this a short-term initiative or have you changed fundamentally who and what you are? Exactly. And, you know, when you talk about documenting it, now, I'm I'm always a big fan of uh, tailoring what you do to what you need in the real world. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I'd have someone stop by my office and say, Michael, does, does ISO require us to document blah, blah, blah? <laughs> and invariably, my first question, my first answer was, gee, I don't know. Um, if there was no such thing as ISO, would you have to document it in the real world? <laughs> Nine like times out of 10, they would say, well, it would probably be good if we remembered this and this. So I guess so. Great. If you need it in the real world. Don't worry about ISO. Just go do it. Yeah. The tenth time when they say, no, absolutely not. But you know, then the answer is, if you don't need it in the real world, probably you don't. Let's go look at the clause and we'll take it. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yep. And there's a few times in there where there's something that you wouldn't need in the real world, but mostly not. Yeah. Um, but I like that so answer. When, yeah, but when the 2015 standard came out, for example, and suddenly all of this stuff that people were doing intuitively was mm-hmm. auditable. Yeah. You know, I, I went you to our... You on the head there. Yeah, I went to our general manager uh, and said, by the way, this is what's going on, the new standard, blah, blah, blah. Um, Is that something you can talk to in an audit? And he says, well, pause, long pause. <laughs> I know what the answers to those questions are, but it's probably in 20 different emails and a couple of post-it notes. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yep. Yeah. Okay. Tell you what. And I said, let's, let's get, let's call a meeting with, you know, the right people in the room and make it small, but, but, uh, and just try to put down on paper the important parts of what you're already doing. Which, by yes. the way, is a much easier sell than there's a new requirement, you know, <laughs> which people don't want to hear about a new requirement. But oh, nope. yeah, we're already doing this. You just want to write it down somewhere so yep. we know where to we know where to find it if we need it. Yeah, that was fairly easy, and you know, so I scheduled. I, I had to call a couple of meetings in sequence, and I scheduled them over lunch. And my budget called for a lot of pizza that year, you know, <laughs> but because, because you feed people and they're much more likely to show up. Yep. Um, and we, and we knocked it out we mm-hmm. went through it mm-hmm. and then, you know, reviewed it from time to time and it, and it worked yeah. very well for us. And now, it was, I found a yeah. couple of issues that I've run into when I go to, uh, to documenting these with folks before is one issue is some of this seems so intuitive, seems so common sense that they're like, why do we need to docu- document it? Of course, that's the case. And the other problem I run into is I feel like, and I know this has been the case with me personally, is when you document what you will do, you're indirectly saying no to 50 other things. Yep. And people get very uh, apprehensive about the second one and they feel like the first one's a waste of time. How do you overcome? those objections or do you even see those same objections um the in any there's not a one-size-fits-all answer it really depends you know the people the situation and working through it but in general i would say the part with something being obvious is okay we're not going to document it out in, in 50 pages. You know, it's obvious we don't need 50 pages. We can use two sentences. 
yep. or something. Just or a couple of bullet points. Good but point. but the thing is that <clears throat> when you are deep in the middle of a complicated task, there are a lot of things about it that are obvious to you. You know, mm -hmm. you're you're uh, disassembling a machine and putting it back together again. You know where all these parts are and everything. You break in the middle to have lunch, and you come back an hour later. <laughs> what the heck is all this? I don't know where all these pieces are. Yes. You know, and so it's um, so what's obvious is very context dependent, mm -hmm. and it helps if you can make a few notes so you know where you were and what you were thinking at the time because things are going to change and you yeah. are going to get distracted and you're going to have to yep. come back to it. Okay, yep. you know, that that's part of it. The part about if you say yes to this, you're saying no to those things, you're doing that anyway. Yeah. You know, because in real life, you can never stay open to 51 things at once. You've got to pick something to work on. <laughs> And whatever it is you've picked to work on, probably you should keep working on that and not get distracted. You know, uh, uh, you don't want the company to be running on ADHD or something and, right, and right, right. constantly doing different things. No, <laughs> you do a job so you finish it and you can invoice it. Right. Then you do the next job. Okay, since you're making those decisions anyway, just make a note of what you're doing. And, you know, you've and probably you've even made some decisions that in general, we're going to take these jobs and we're going to leave those ones aside. OK, why? Well, because of reasons. Great. Yeah. Make a note, you know, that for right now, because of the way things are, it's useful to us to go in this direction and not that direction. Mm -hmm. By the way, you've just defined a company policy. Yeah. Company policies don't have to last forever. It might Correct. last a month or a year or whatever until times change. Correct. But in the meantime, you know, you've now got something that helps you make the next decision more easily. Yeah. And that's all a policy is, is something that just helps you make the next decision, make it easier yep. next time. Something I it, tell my team real regular when we're going through on these projects, because, you know, one person may be working on projects for 10 different clients and yep. you just can't keep this straight in your head. No. And I, I'll, I'll tell them something like you need to document this right down. We'll have a little five minute conversation. I'm like, OK, now go log that in the system. Well, why do I need to log it? I just told you. I said your future self in two weeks will say thank you. Yes. Yes. Do your future you know, self a favor. You know. One other one other thing that I should mention about about context of the organization, um, because it's sometimes documenting some basic things really can save you grief later on. And I want to give an example. There's yeah. uh, one of the one of the units in our in our business was a service organization that was embedded with the customer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, customer had this great big, had this great big plant somewhere and our people were on a couple of floors of one of their buildings. Um, and there was, you know, a standing contract that they would from January 1st to December 31st every year. And they write a new one. Mm -hmm. And basically the terms stayed the same. The prices would change. Right. But, um, and under normal conditions, uh, our people were doing this, this, and this for them. Mm -hmm. But everybody knew that if the customer came in tomorrow morning and said, for two weeks, everyone's got to come to work in a bright green hat, they would do it. Yeah. Because that's how the relationship was set up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you're there embedded with the customer on the customer's site to provide services. Normally, you're providing these services, but if they need something else, you're not going to say no. The Correct. most that will happen is someone might dicker over the price, but you're going to do it. Right. <laughs> okay. So I show up to do an internal audit. I say, you know, so what do you have in the way of a management system? And, you know, they 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 hand me a, a, a quality manual that, that looks like, like it two was. two pages long. 
Well, no, it looks like everybody else's quality manual in the world. That was the problem. I said, ah. why did you write this? Oh, well, you know, I thought we needed a quality manual. Okay, <laughs> that was the old ver- You used to. You don't anymore. Right. But that's not the real issue. The real issue is this makes it look like you've got a freestanding QMS with mm-hmm. processes that you're following. But we all know. The mm-hmm. customer can change your direction like that. Yep. Now, if I'm auditing to this, and in the middle of the audit, the customer comes in and changes your direction, I'm in within my rights to start writing up every single thing that I see someone do because it's no longer matching your procedures. You don't want that. That's not, and it's not just that it would be a pain in the neck. It's actually wrong. It would be wrong for me to do that because you're supposed to be doing this thing to support your customer. Correct. So somewhere, somehow, you need to have something that says that, that explains Mm -hmm. the relationship and says, by the way, you know, we do this. Uh, We use the customer's tools for these Mm -hmm. things. We use their processes for these things. And the only thing that we have independent control over are things that they don't care about, which is like, the HR process. Right. There's some other totally internal things, you know, well, internal finance processes. Well, you know, I'm normally not auditing finance anyway, but right. those those kinds of activities, yes, they had independent control over. But outside of that, there were general guidelines, but it was all based on the customer interaction. Yep. And so, you know, once I explained that, oh, okay, that makes sense. Next time I was out there, that's exactly what they had. And Fantastic. it was much shorter. And it exactly explained what the relationship was. It's like, good. You've now insulated yourself against a bunch of totally useless findings. Yep. That's the point. Yep. Is, you know, protecting yourself against auditors gone crazy. Yeah. And <laughs> as the auditor, you have to audit what they have. People think yeah. so often when you're going through an audit, well, they're auditing me against the standard. Not really. Not really. They're auditing no. you against your procedures, assuming they're compliant with a the standard. They're yeah. auditing you on your business. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I, I I'll give you a concrete example of how that of of how that can come back and bite you. Uh, some years earlier, we were part of a different organization. This was actually an ISO fourteen thousand audit, but the principle is exactly the same. Yeah, auditor was going through, um, and you know, in addition to checking other things, he was looking at the um, uh the dates on our fire extinguishers, you know, the, the dates that they were checked and signed off. Sure. Um, and he said, you missed a date on this one. You know, you, uh, it's, it's currently July. And the last time this was checked was April. And he wrote mm-hmm. us up. Um, and we said, but, but wait a minute. The law that governs checking your fire extinguishers only says you have to do it once a year. Right. We did it in April. This is July. What are you writing us up for? He said, law governs fire extinguishers doesn't matter. Your procedure yep. says you check them once a month. Yep. It's been more than a month. Done. Yep. That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And yep. there was there was no way to argue about that. It's like, yeah, you're right. Our procedure yeah. says that. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, this is the uh, the chief complaint I have with uh, most uh, most consultants out here, and, and I'll I'll probably get some, some a little bit of hate mail for this, but yeah. um, is and don't get me wrong, we have our own stock documents as well. We we all start from a cookie cutter place, but start you have to start somewhere. But you cannot finish with the cookie cutter mold that matches every cookie in the world. Right. We have to get specific to the company. And honestly, a third of the consultation projects I've ever taken on actually did the numbers here a while back. And it was almost exactly one out of three were cleanup work from someone else because the company they'd hired came in and gave them every conceivable requirement and contingency possible. I'm like, yeah, there's no way that you're you're if you follow the procedure. There's no way you'll run into something not being covered. But my gosh, guys, this these are ball and chains on you. They're like, we know it's killing us. And so we might take them from 500 pages of documentation to 100. And it just, you know, it gets silly because people put these these requirements in here. Well, it sounds like what we should do. Is it what you should do, though? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You always got to be careful about, you know, taking something on because it sounds like a good idea. Yes. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I remember uh, one year, again, some years in the past uh, <clears throat> that um, I'm, I'm with my manager and we're, we're working out, you know, okay, what are the long-term improvement projects that you need to be working on? And there's one of them that, because I'm an idiot, I tossed in there and said, you know what? This sounds like a good idea. Let's add that to the list. <laughs> well, it was a good idea, but nobody was asking for it. Right. Which means that, you know, when it came down to the day-to-day -day struggle for where do I spend this hour, nobody's screaming for it. I can start working on that next week. Correct. Guess what happened? 52 times I started working on it next week. And all of a sudden, the year's gone, and I've made zero progress. Yes. Which, you know, yes. didn't look so good in my annual review. Oh, there's this project you did nothing on. Yeah, well, nobody really cared. Yeah, but you signed up for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Boom. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you, you got to be careful about things that, quote, you know, sound like a good idea, but nobody wants. Yep. On the other hand, now... The so when you um, with with Bosch and also with uh, before then when uh, this small startup that was uh, we were acquired by Ericsson um, in both cases when you have large global companies that are in a lot of lines of work it's more or less inevitable that they're going to create a lot of central directives that everyone has to follow and mm -hmm. you know then the local organizations look at that and either they're intimidated by them or they panic or something mm -hmm. um and what i learned in both of those cases is rather than being intimidated by them and rather than panicking just read them <laughs> because no, I mean it, it sounds silly, but yeah, because it's in the so first true, place, though. because in the first place, you know, they're usually not bad things to do, because you know, and usually they were written because once upon a time somebody somewhere in the world working for that company did the opposite, and it blew up <laughs> in his face. So it's like, don't do that again. Okay, yeah. but because. Most of them are sensible in that sense. It's often not hard no. to comply. And the other thing is that there's a lot of times it doesn't apply to you because yeah. it's only about if you're doing this thing. And right. you know, you may not realize that until you get to clause 17A. Right. Which then says, Oh, yeah, no, this whole thing doesn't apply to us. Therefore, you may as well mark us down as compliant because, you know. Correct. Whenever we do this task, which is to say never, we do it this way. Yeah. Check. Next. Well, this will probably be a good point to uh, wrap up because we're running low on time here. But oh, I, I see because, yeah. you know, I, 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 obviously well, you come from tech world as well. So I'm sure this will kind of make some sense for you too. Um, is the uh, app for that craze, right? And I'll tell you where it drives me bonkers. But I see this in management systems with forms and procedures and work instructions and checklists and all this type of stuff. It's the same same problem. But I've got three kids. OK, yeah. so I've got a kid in elementary, junior high and high school between the three kids. There's probably 10 or more software apps that we have to monitor so that we can get the teacher's syllabus and the homework assignments. <laughs> and I'm like, like, I get it in this one instance, adding a new something made it better. But let's look at the whole picture. And my gosh, if there was a way that I could say, you know what, we're exempt from using your app. I would do it. I would love to do it. And I'm actually considering trying to do that. But you know, it's a new school, so I don't want to cause a ruckus. But right. it's the same type of thing in our workplace, though. Just go all through the whole thing. Do you actually need it? And right. because, you know, because the, make the decision. Because the thing is that the the incremental cost of adding one of them is nothing. If you look at it by itself, it looks like pennies. Mm -hmm. And when you do that over and over again across You're the done. organization it sinks you yes i mean here the thing is the easiest solution 
to when the problem happens, and once you figure out what the root cause was, is to say, well, let's make a rule that that never happens again. And that's quick and decisive as long as it only happens once. Correct. But after the 10th or the 20th or the 30th, mm-hmm. oh, that gets painful. And then it's much more useful to like back up and rethink the whole thing mm-hmm. from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you can incorporate those because each one of those is a risk mitigation measure somehow. Each yeah. of those rules. Could they all be lumped up together under another could, higher level cause or rule? Exactly. Exactly. Uh-huh. And if you do exactly that so that you've rethought the whole process, then suddenly you can cancel 30 documents. Yes. Yes. And, and that's what's beautiful. And, 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 and beautiful. And everybody's grateful. And you're actually doing things in a smarter way. And that's true continual improvement. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so I, this will have to be the last thing because I no, I, I realize. Keep, no. you're, you're, but uh, you know, I went. You'll 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 get a kick out of this. I think is we went down to a uh, Corpus Christi for my son. I was on a swim team, and he made it to state. And so we went and stayed in the hotel, and we were swimming at the pool. And it's just because this is what I do. I look around. I, I like to look at signs. I'm curious what signs and notifications are everywhere I go. My wife gets annoyed with me pointing them out. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm looking at the signs for the pool. And like, I remember pool rules used to be like two or three rules, no food, no alcohol, don't run. We're yeah, done. Right. Good. Right. Yeah. This one had, I think 12 rules on it. I'm like, oh okay. My I mean, we're getting a little litigious these days. That's fine. One of the rules, kid you not, do not go swimming. If you have had diarrhea in the past 48 hours. And I'm like, well, was this a preventative measure or a corrective <laughs> measure? <laughs> Either way, you need to document this. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure that whoever made that sign figured if we don't, somebody, <laughs> you know, and but it, it gets out, like, away from you. It gets away from you because you know, yeah, you think. There's there's somebody out there who dot 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 dot. <laughs> oh, but no, this this stuff can definitely definitely get uh, a little crazy and out of hand. But no, I mean to to the point you're making though is if you take the time to properly document who and what your business is, and even if that's not it what it is today, go ahead and you know you're going to grow into another vision. Document who you want to be. And measure it on your management review, and it all will fall into place. And it Bingo. actually becomes a meaningful, worthwhile, beneficial part of your system. There you go. Exactly. So now I this has been a lot of fun. We definitely, definitely got to get you on again. I think we got a couple of other days we want to talk about, but uh yep. Yep. this has been fun. So tell folks real quick, how can they find out more about you? Tell us about your blog, you know. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So the um, <clears throat> so I've got a, a blog. It's Pragmatic Quality. Um, it's just called Pragmatic Quality Blog. Uh, so it's at pragmatic-quality.blogspot.com. I'll make sure um, there's a link in the show notes. Yep, yep. And, um, you know, I, I post... Um, a new article every Thursday morning. Well, morning Pacific time, because that's where I, wish I am. I, could, uh, I wish I would say good. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, but you've got a podcast, which I don't. So you see it balances. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it, I cover all kinds of things. I mean, a lot of it is um, different specific topics. So, you know, we were talking about context of the organization here. I've had three articles recently on that i've got another one that's queued up to come out in another week or two um but when if i if i attend an interesting webinar and there's somebody out there that's got interesting things to say i'll devote an issue to just talking about them and how that relates to pretty cool other topics um occasion occasionally uh, there may be something in the news that actually relates to the quality business. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I try not to go crazy there, but if I yep. see a connection, I'll draw that. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but yeah, anyway, good. that's that's kind of the place not the to typical. Look. Uh, let me think. Uh, overly snooty intellectual. You know, where you've got you know the the twenty letter acronyms at the end of your LinkedIn oh, profile. Oh. No, no, I do not have, I do not have, 
uh, all, all of that stuff. No, the, but the, and the, the whole theme running through it is do what you need. You know, it's like, it's like, um, I've got a, a post early on, uh, on defining quality. I figure, you know, um, Every authority has a different definition. You know, Robert Pierce famously went went insane trying to do this. So naturally, <laughs> I'm going to take a swing at it. But honestly, um, you know, quality means getting what you want. Yeah. Right. But you want to talk about, you know, compliance to requirements or, or functionality for suitability for purpose or whatever. All of that means getting what you want. Yeah. All you're trying to do, this whole industry, which, you know, there's lots of complication because there's lots of ways things could go wrong. You know, nothing can be made foolproof because fools are so ingenious. But, um, <laughs> but that's a so whole there's lot of, in itself. There's lots of ways things could go wrong. But all we're trying to do is get you what you want. Yeah. So, really, that's why I say I talk about it as pragmatic quality. The I like idea it. is do as much as you need to get the results you need and then stop yes. and go do something else. <laughs> anyway. I love it. Yeah. This has been a lot of fun. I, yeah, I, I love it. I love it. No, definitely, huge of time, it's worth but, checking out. Um, I've had a chance to go through please. and read some of the posts and obviously you get a taste of, uh, of what you're going to get there. But yep. uh, man, yep. I appreciate it very much. This has been a lot of fun and we will talk to you soon. Sounds great. Talk Take to care. you then. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening in. This is a little bit of a uh, longer episode than normal, but I think well, well worth uh, the time. Now, if uh, I don't believe I have made the formal announcement to it yet, but we are partnering with OGGN, the Oil & Gas Global Network, and we are putting on a first-of-its-kind conference called the Energy Continuity conference we're getting the website going live here in just the next few days but this is going to be a chance for folks in the energy industry to talk about not just business continuity but um contingency planning talking about risk talking about all of these things that are inherent to all of our businesses but sometimes we just don't know how and where to go so there's gonna be a lot of information coming about that soon and we're also going to be putting out a new qms boot camp video soon here just discussing risk and contingency planning in specific. So lots and lots of great stuff coming soon. So be certain to stay tuned. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and listening and hope you guys have a great